a daily basis. Thank you. Are there any questions? Speaker. The Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, I refer to your claim in question time last week when you stated, and I quote, we have had a significant increase in demand, 14 per cent in emergency department presentations this year alone, and comments from Mr Mark Duncan Smith, President of the Australian Medical Association, WA, clarifying that there had been, uh, overall there had been a 3 to 4 per cent increase, which is in fact consistent with yearly trends across your term. And I ask, given COVID-19 has been the scapegoat for your government's failure to address the health crisis, which has been worsening over the last four years, how do you respond to AMA, WA, the AMA WA president confirming it? It is your government's neglect which has caused the crisis, not COVID-19. The Minister for Health. There's more parts to that, um, to that question, uh, Madam Speaker, than an episode of Home and Away. Uh, but let me go through some of these things, Madam Speaker. The fact of the matter is, is that every health system in this nation and internationally is struggling with a spike in demand as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Your, that's your curve. Whether you like it or that's not, member. I know it doesn't fit your narrative, but that's well, tough. Doesn't fit the and data. you can't come into this place with your statistics data. to try to pretend no, no. otherwise. So no, let, no. let me... Let so, Member, you have asked the question and you've held up your chart. Uh, if we could just have the answer from the Minister, please. So let me take the Member through this very slowly, Madam Speaker, because that's clearly the speed with which he learns. <laughs> if you compare December 2020 with December 2019, we've had an increase in presentations of 11.6%. January 2021 to 2019, an increase of 10%. In March 2021 to, uh, to, to March 2019, increase of 5 per cent, and in April an increase also. But importantly, Madam Speaker, and I've been saying this now for weeks, weeks on end, whereas the member comes into this place with his same material, the same accusations, and we beat them off day in, day out, the fact of the matter is that triage ones between 2021 compared to three years ago is up 10 per cent. Triage twos up 15 per cent. These are critically ill patients. These are the people who are having the impact upon the patient flow in hospital EDs. Now, I know it's true to say that if you take the numbers globally, that is the very highest security and the very lowest. You've seen a modest uptick of around about 5 per cent between 2019 and 2020, 21. But the fact of the matter remains that the people coming to our EDs are sicker, and the fact of the matter remains that the people presenting with mental health issues are, more are coming, coming there with more complex issues. That's led to the length of episode of care going up. That's led to the, the, the constraints which are sitting on our EDs at the moment. I notice, Madam Speaker, that the member for VATS, who um, unfortunately can't be with us during this week, and we wish her all the very best in her struggles, but clearly on the weekends is able to, to um, make uh, several um, work related, um, to undertake several work related activities, where she said that between the first six months of the last six months of 2019, pre COVID, was 80, there was 80,400 uh, average presentations per month, comparable to the first six months of 2021, there was 81,200. Well, Madam Speaker, not only has she got it wrong, the average is actually 94,219, uh, 94, but she's comparing the first half of one year during the summer months with the second half of another year during the winter months. Now, no homework at all, Madam Speaker, no accuracy, no even pretense at prosecuting the truth in relation to this debate. But if the member wishes to stand up again, we'll explain to him again in very slow language, very slow sentences, and perhaps we'll produce some charts as well to if hopefully that once, at one point in the future, he will actually get it. So a question. supplementary question to Thank the Leader of the much. Opposition. Minister, given the amount of spin and selective information coming from your office, how are Western Australians supposed to trust that you can deliver the health system that they deserve? The Minister for Health. Madam Speaker, that's one of the longest supplementaries I've ever heard. I'm, and had a bigger, 
bigger preface than, uh, than War and Peace. But, Madam Speaker, there is no spin here. We are being truthful with the people of Western Australia. We are being truthful with the people of Western Australia. That will be a great opportunity for you to learn those lessons, uh, Member for Cottesloe. Being truthful with the people of Western Australia. The fact of the matter is that our EDs are under intense pressure. Our health doctors and nurses working on the front line are working harder than ever, having come off the, the, the back of one of the most stressful periods of their careers. And that's why we are undertaking the most significant expansion of our hospital, um, uh, uh, hospital beds and our hospital workforce. But it's not easy. It's not easy. But thank goodness we've got a McGowan Labor government because at least we're dedicated to the hard work. Yeah. Yeah. The member for Churchlands. Um, my question is to the Premier. I refer to the announcement that the McGowan Labor government will invest an additional $1.9 billion in health and mental health services across Western Australia. And I ask, can the Premier outline to the House how this significant boost in funding will address the unprecedented demand in WA's health system and support the delivery of high quality care to West Australians? And can the Premier advise the House if he is aware of any threats to the health of West Australians? Madam Premier. Speaker, can I thank the member for Churchlands for the question and can I also acknowledge the former Deputy Premier, uh, the Honourable Eric Ripper, uh, who is in the uh, President's, uh, President's Gallery uh, Even today. The Welcome, Speaker's uh, Gallery, yes. In the Speaker's <laughs> Gallery, sorry. <laughs> <In the speakers. laughs> Welcome. <laughs> In the Speaker's Gallery today, welcome, uh, welcome, uh, Eric. Um, Madam Speaker, uh, Western Australia has the uh, best-funded health system uh, in Australia. Uh, we are per capita spending 18 per cent higher than the national average uh, on our health system uh, in our state. Uh, but we are under heavy demand, as the Health Minister has outlined, uh, with enormous increases in ED presentations, particularly. Uh, with uh, co complex uh, mental health uh, reasons uh, and a range of conditions which are placing pressure uh, on our emergency departments. Uh, so on the weekend, the Health Minister and I announced uh, significant funding in the state budget uh, that is coming up of $1.9 billion boost uh, in health and mental health funding across Western Australia. Uh, that will mean more staff, more beds and more services uh, on top of our existing funding uh, for our health, health system. And uh, on top of that, Madam Speaker, uh, we'll be putting in place $1.8 billion for the new Women's and Babies Hospital at the QE2 site uh, in Netherlands. Yes. And on top of that, $1.3 billion over the next four years on important capital works improvements, both in the city and the regions all over the state. Uh, this will mean an additional 332 new beds across the health system. Uh, it'll mean um, an additional 100 extra doctors, around 500 uh, extra nurses, uh, and that is all on top of the already announced expansion in beds, uh, plus $495 million in mental health spending uh, across uh, Western Australia, including $129 million of that towards our youth uh, mental health. The reason we can do that is we have had strong financial management yeah, over yeah, the course of the last yeah. four and a half years, uh, which has put the state in a strong financial position, certainly compared to the last government and compared to any other government in Australia, which allows us to invest uh, in important health initiatives all over the state. The member asked me about threats. Uh, Madam Speaker, yesterday or the day before, we received a letter from a Mr Clive Palmer from Queensland. Oh, no. Uh, it was, oh, no. Uh, his, letter, his letter demanded... Sorry, the Premier has the floor. He's the Liberal and National Party's friend. He does fund their election campaigns, you Madam Speaker. Are. Now, he, um, he, um, <laughs> Mr Palmer's letter, Mr Palmer's letter from a lawyer uh, basically threatened the West Australian Government with legal action if we don't suspend the vaccination program uh, for COVID-19. Uh, it, was, it was shocking, appalling, disturbing uh, dis and disgusting that Mr uh, Palmer would do that. It shows an appalling degree of ignorance on his behalf uh, and it is an appalling misuse of his wealth that he is prepared to do that and threaten the health and wellbeing and lives 
particularly of older people uh, in this state. Uh, if he's successful in his action and he's threatening some sort of injunction against the state, uh, well then uh, it will damage the health of not just West Australians but all Australians and people could potentially uh, die. Uh, Madam Speaker, we will not give in to this bullying and bizarre behaviour by Mr Clive Palmer once again. Bullying and bizarre behaviour towards the people of this state. There's a record of doing that on multiple occasions. This is another example of that, but I must say this is a particularly disturbing example because what it does is it, does, it doesn't just threaten the finances of the state, it threatens the lives and health of people in this state. The member for Rowe. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. I refer to the state government's school student wellbeing study conducted by Detect WA which found around 40 per cent of high school students are experiencing moderate to high levels of emotional distress, a threefold increase from 2014. And I ask, Minister, can you confirm that school nurses have been pulled out of WA schools to staff state-run vaccine centres, leaving schools with diminished or no nursing staff? The Minister for Health. So on the one hand, Madam Speaker, the member would have us be concerned about the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health and wellbeing of our students. On the other hand, Madam Speaker, he wants us to tie our hand behind our back in terms of how we fight COVID-19. I would have thought the best way we can, we can address the concerns that young people have around COVID-19 is to get the, take the opportunity to get as many people vaccinated as possible. I'm not quite sure where you're coming from here, Member. Do you want us to solve the problem or don't you? Do you want us to solve the problem or don't you? In the last election, we committed to an extra 100 uh, school psychologists, which will go a long way to equipping our schools to provide a better environment for the kids that they, care, that they look after, to make sure that we can continue to, uh, to uh, um, respond to the issues around mental health and wellbeing. And of course, as the, um, as the Premier has just said, uh, we've, um, re we've also just announced an increase of $495 million in spending in the Mental Health Commission for a range of mental health uh, uh, services in our community. But the thing we must do now is to get the community vaccinated. We, it's all hands on deck. Order, please. I know where you. I know where you stand, member on vac on vaccinations, because we've seen it from your mate Clive Palmer. We know what your position on, on vaccinations is. It's. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Speaker, once again, I concede to the member for Gurrawin in terms of Even the, the, wisdom, for the wisdom, wisdom of this place. She provides great insight into the offerings of the member for Cottesloe there. I th Minister, I do think you're referring to the member for Lansdowne. My apologies, member for Lansdowne. But, Madam Speaker, the fact of the matter is that we have to get as many people vaccinated as possible. I've announced today that we've engaged a whole range of nurse graduates that are now going to take up roles in our vaccination clinics. We have assistance in nursing in our vaccination clinics. We've, we, we have asked 35 of our 300, uh, uh, 300 odd uh, school based nurses to, to be able to do some shifts in our vaccination clinics as well, because we want to make sure we get as much of this stuff into the arms of Western Australians. That's the only way we're going to get out of this, Madam Speaker. That's the only way we're going to get out of this. And with all the impacts that it has, both upon the physical wellbeing of the members of the West Australian community, as well as the mental health issues that they confront. And so we make no apologies for making sure that we have got all hands on deck in terms of our efforts to get people vaccinated. A supplementary question to the member for Rowe. Uh, thanks, Minister for Health. Can you confirm that those 35 nurses that you are taking out of the schools, uh, is that the full extent of it, or will there be more on top of that? Uh, Minister. I can't give any guarantees that that's the extent of it, Madam Speaker. What I can guarantee is that we'll do, ev we'll do everything possible to make sure that we can protect the people of Western Australia by getting them vaccinated as soon as possible. The member for Joondalup. 
My question is to the Minister for Health. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's massive investment of $1.9 billion into our health system, and I ask, can the Minister outline to the House how this investment will help deliver more doctors, nurses and midwives for our health system? And can the Minister advise the House of what strategies will be undertaken to recruit more health staff for our hospitals? The Ma Minister for Health. Madam Speaker, I thank the member for the question. It's a very important one. And as members would be aware, the Premier and I committed to an extra 332 beds um, over the weekend as part of our significant expansion of the hospital system. That will require an extra 100 doctors and 500 nurses for that, al for that alone. But, Madam Speaker, uh, we have to recruit more. There's no point in having more beds unless we can have more doctors and nurses to stand by those beds to provide world-class health care for the people of Western Australia. And when we came to, to office, Madam Speaker, there were 34,700 members of our health team. Today there are over 39,000, a 14 per cent increase uh, in, in just our first term. 45 per cent of all public sector jobs, Madam Speaker, were created uh, in, the, in the health system to continue to provide great health care. And in just the first six months, Madam Speaker, the first six months of this year, we have recruited more than 750 FTE nursing and midwifery staff into our health services, and, um, and there will be more. But, Madam Speaker, the labour market for doctors and nurses is very tight. Because of the, the situation with our international borders, we can't recruit as many overseas doctors and nurses that would usually come to this great state as part of their, their ongoing career opportunities. So, Madam Speaker, today I've, we've announced a significant investment in a campaign to ensure that we get more people uh, in our, in our um, in nurses in our health system. We're investing $71.6 million into a health workforce attraction and retention strategy. The budget will commit $35.6 million extra for new workforce initiatives. This is $36 million. Uh, this is on top of the $36 million election commitment for, um, focused on 600 more graduate nurses. So let's start with the international campaign, uh, uh, international and interstate strategy, Madam Speaker. We are bringing in, as we speak, 209 junior doctors from the UK and Ireland to start work in our WA health system in the next few months months. $2 million for an even more targeted international, uh, national and local advertising campaign. A key focus of the recruitment tra uh, strategy is attracting experienced nurses and midwives back into the workforce. We're providing refresher courses, Madam Speaker, free of charge, um, which were paused during COVID-19, to bring experienced nurses and midwives back into the system and to assist others to upgrade their skills. These refresher courses will provide a smooth transition back into the health system, and the McGowan government will fully fund the cost of the online refresher training um, and will facilitate paid clinical placements for those who have completed the training. In addition to that, Ms. Uh, Madam Speaker, we want to make sure that we continue to um, engage as many uh, experienced nurses and midwives, but also make sure that they are supported by great nursing graduates. And in a typical year, about 700 graduates will be offered places in the health system, Madam Speaker. And as a result of this, um, uh, uh, as a result of this initiative, we will uh, top. Uh, the, this will come on top of the 600 new graduates and nurses already promised. This year, we will recruit 1,100 new graduates. We will, will receive jobs. And, Madam Speaker, I just want to draw your attention, Madam Speaker, because I think all members of the of the of the chamber should be concerned. It's important to, know, to understand that if you're going to go out there and make accusations of of, of a government and their efforts to recruit. You do so in a way which is truthful with the people of, of West Australian community. So I was disturbed, Madam Speaker, to see a tweet from the member from Cottesloe recently that said that, said that we were promised 1,000 new nurses and Cook delivered none. So, Madam Speaker, let me take the opportunity just to explain, again in very slow English, to the member for Cottesloe that today we have recruited 927 of those 1,100 nurse graduates already in our system today, working the wards of the WA health system, providing great support to our experienced doctors and nurses. By the end of the month, that would have increased to 949. Madam Speaker, this is a tough job. 
The spike in demand in, re in relation to our hospitals is putting the hospital system under great pressure, but we are bringing resources to bear and extra doctors and nurses to bear. But I, one thing I think this health system shouldn't have to bear, and that is the untruthfulness of those opposite and their tweets in the community. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Madam Speaker, my question today is to the Minister for Emergency Services. Minister, I refer to your announcement of 11 caravans being supplied to people seeking emergency and temporary accommodation in the Midwest as a result of the devastation following Cyclone Saroja. And I ask, are you aware that five of your 11 caravans appear to have not been allocated to families in need and are currently parked at the Geraldton State Emergency Services headquarters? And there they are there in all their glory. They don't seem to have left the yard. And I ask, how is this excusable when you announced this measure back on the 21st of July which is already weeks late. The Minister for Emergency Services. I uh, thank the member for the question. And uh, the provision of caravans was part of a response to requests from the community directly. Uh, and we consulted with some of the, or indeed all of the 16 local governments that were affected by Cyclone Sarosia. Uh, there was feedback from communities through the local councils, through local community outreach. Uh, and the member should be reminded that there were a range of accommodation uh, uh, offered and given and taken to people impacted by the cyclone. Now, it's not always that uh, people wanted a caravan. Indeed, some people were provided with accommodation in towns like Geraldton. Uh, other people had other sources of accommodation. Uh, other people made other arrangements. So the number of caravans that were provided uh, was in, uh, in a result of direct contact with the community. Those caravans were taken to Geraldton, where they are being uh, made uh, good. Uh, they, you will know, uh, member, that if you try to buy a caravan in Western Australia today, you can't get one. Uh, if you wanted to order a new one, it would take at least six months. So these caravans are second hand. Uh, and were provided on that basis that they could be provi provided quickly uh, for the people who needed them. Uh, there are some, uh, some issues with the caravan in terms of licensing, that they have to be licensed. But in, in relation to the people who are getting these caravans, uh, they are the right fix because some people want to stay in on their communities in Northampton. They want to be on properties that have been destroyed. They want to be close to animals. They want to be close to communities. So the response we've provided in terms of accommodation has been varied and bespoke according to need. The need based on what the community told us in terms of a small number of people was the provision of caravans. They are being provided. I, don't, I can't give you the exact reason why those caravans are there at the moment in Geraldton, but they are in the region ready to go. Obviously, most of those caravans have now been provided to the people who need them. And um, uh, if it's an issue of putting a, a registration on a, on, a, on a caravan and getting it on site, then that can be done quite quickly. Supplementary question. Supplementary question. I am staggered by that response. So where in your press release does it outline that these caravans were not fit for use when you took them to the people in the north in the, in the shore of Northampton, Chapman Valley and and uh, and Jordan? That's staggering. You sent out right. caravans which are not Sorry. Fit for point of order. I'm taking a point of order. Please sit down. Uh, uh, this is an opportunity for a supplementary question, not That's a, right. Not it's not an opportunity for further argument. So you've asked your question, I'd ask the Minister to respond. Uh, member, they are adequate for, uh, as caravans, to be provided for people. Sorry, we just member, to hear from the Minister. Member, Thanks. The, the response, quite frankly, the response of the National Party to an issue that has impacted your own constituents has been woeful has been woeful. Now, I've been in the community in the Midwest many times. I've not seen you there, member, once. I've not seen you there once. OK? Now, it's very, it's very easy. It's very easy. It's very easy from the cheap seats. It's very easy from the cheap seats to, to criticise. But this is a huge 
disaster that has impacted many areas of our state across 16 uh, uh, local government regions. Uh, we have provided a massive response in terms of clean-up. We have provided a massive response in terms of ongoing support and emergency accommodation. We went to the community, we went to local governments, we asked what is it you need. A range of uh, requests came back. In terms of caravans, it was 11. From all the Shire presidents and CEOs contacted, they said they wanted 11 caravans. So guess what they got, member? They got 11 caravans. If there are more caravans needed, they will get those. Order, please. But if it is not easy in the current market to walk into a, to a shop and get a, get a brand new caravan, these caravans are fit for purpose. They are late models and they are being provided and they are being provided uh, gratefully by the people who need them. Now, if you sit there and criticise and carp on, I'd rather you get behind the effort that's being launched to support your own constituents. That concludes that question. Uh, the member for Bicton. My question is to the Minister for Transport. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to permanently protecting the Belia wetlands, which was delivered last week with the passing of the Metropolitan Region Scheme Belia Wetlands Bill. And I ask, can the Minister remind the House how this government came to the decision to stop the destructive Row 8 project and protect the wetlands? And can the Minister update the House on the work underway to deliver a long-term responsible solution to getting trucks off local roads in the southern suburbs? The Minister for Transport. Thank you. And can I thank the member for Bicton for that question and, of course, her work over many years to help deliver this commitment. Members, it was with great pride last week that we finally delivered the commitment that we gave to the people, and that was to save the Belia wetlands for future generations, members. Remember, we took it to the 2017 election, and of course, the Liberal National Party frustrated this policy commitment in the other place. And again, we took it to the 2021 commitment. And I'll refer to some of the comments and the attitudes from the Liberal National Party in a minute. But what we've been able to do is change that reservation from roads to parks and recreation. Members, we've also extended the A-class reserve boundary to include the Belia wetlands. And this has been a fight over many decades, members. And there's been people that have been working very hard, year in, year out, to deliver it. Can I thank my parliamentary colleagues, the member for Fremantle, the member for Bicton, the member for Willoughby, and can I also thank the member, federal member for Fremantle, Josh Wilson, for all of his work too. Can I acknowledge all the work um, done by the community, the, the general community and also some of those community leaders, in particular Kim Drav Dravnix and also Kate Kelly from the Save Billia Wetlands Group. Can I acknowledge all the work they did over many years? Of course, we've extended the A-class reserve. We've um, now deleted, we are deleting the Row 8 corridor. We're also, of course, um, building new infrastructure under the stewardship of the Minister for the Environment, extended boardwalks and more infrastructure so more people can actually appreciate these beautiful wetlands. And of course we're doing that and at the same time we're delivering the broader commitments of moving more freight onto rail, improving the roads leading into Fremantle like High Street, developing intermodals, all those commitments being delivered. And of course what's the Liberal National Party attitude? They still want to build Row 89. They still want to build Row 89. And again, the National Party, you think they'd be more concerned about regional roads, but their commitment always has been on the Perth Freight Link. That's the only road project I've heard them talk about. The Liberal National Party and in the upper other house, the Honourable Nick Goran and his new apprentice, I think Neil Thompson, talking about these, these projects. Nick Goran. The leader. The, please sit down, Minister. I'm taking point of order. Uh, the minister should refer to the member by their, their full title. Uh, the Honourable, Nick that Ryan. is that is uh, no correct. If you're referring, sorry, I'm giving you ruling. Um, if you're referring to a member in another place, you need to refer to them, uh, refer to them appropriately. Yep. Honourable Nick Goran, sorry about that, and the Honourable Nick um, Neil Thompson. So, the leaders. Honourable Nick Goran, who of course led the Liberal Party 
from a record, I think, six seats in South Metro to zero seats. Zero seats. Honey, I shrunk the Liberal Party. That is a... That. That. That's a good line. <laughs> that. Good line. I like that line. <laughs> is the description of the Honourable Nick Goran. <laughs> Shrunk the Liberal Party into oblivion and now still in the other place, insulting our commitment and insulting the people of Western Australia who have voted on this issue twice, members, twice. And now let's look at that whole corridor. Member for Riverton, member for Jandica, member for Bateman, member for Bigton, all fought on this issue. And again, we delivered the overwhelming response that people wanted to save the uh, Billy Wetlands and deliver the alternative freight and trade plan for Western Australia. The uh, Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, I refer to your commitment to recruit, recruit an additional 1,000 nurses in April this year through a national and international advertising blitz. And I ask, uh, have you recruited? How many nurses have you recruited from overseas uh, as part of this advertising blitz? The Minister for Health. <laughs> Madam Speaker, slowly, very slowly. I'm not sure, Did you this but I'm pretty sure I answered this in the last question. <laughs> so, Member. <laughs> Members, the Minister for Health is Madam answering the question, and I'd ask everyone else to listen to the answer. It's, 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 um, it's difficult to know where to start to address the incompetence, Madam Speaker. But look, let me explain. It. I promised the people of Western Australia, Member, that we would re recruit through the Nurse Graduate Intake Program a thousand nurses this year and a thousand nurses next year. Well, normally we take in just over 700. So this is a significant increase. Not only takes account of our election commitment, but goes beyond that. That, because the McGowan Labor government is investing in our health system to meet the demands of our health system. However, in addition to that, the Premier and I have recently announced an expansion of that program, so we have 1,100 this year and 1,200 next year. So this has never been done in our health system before. This is an unprecedented level of expansion and intake of nurse graduates. Now, we want to blend them with experienced nurses, so I will speak this point very slowly. We have recruited 750 experienced nurses so far this year. And although it was a long time ago, at least two questions ago, we have recruited 927 nurse graduates this year. And by the end of this month, that will have got to 949. So that was our commitment, 1,000 nurse graduate places this year. Uh, we're at 927, 949 by the end of this, uh, this month. So, Member, don't bother asking a supplementary. <laughs> Uh, Minister, supplementary. clearly you don't listen to the questions that are asked of you, no. so I'll ask this supplementary question slowly no, no, so that you can no understand. Preamble, Minister, just question. how many nurses have you recruited from overseas as a consequence of your advertising blitz? The Minister for Health. Well, Madam Speaker, as, I, as I've, I've just come from a press conference where we've provided details in relation to that, so maybe I'll take up a little bit more of the, of the opposition's time and question time to explain that program. This is an exciting program whereby we're advertising in the UK, Ireland and other places to try to bring in nurses from, from overseas. They will be uh, re recruited via a program which will see them come into Western Australia in, over and above our cap. They won't have to pay, pay their quarantine, fare, um, their quarantine fees and will provide them with a relocation allowance. It's a program which comes on, which has got nothing to do with the, with the uh, 1,000 nurse graduate commitment that, that we made back in April this year. That's a completely separate, separate commitment. And, um, and as a result of that, uh, we will hopefully have a great blend of nurse graduates and experienced nurses. And as I said, we've already recruited 750 experienced nurses. Now, some of those will be locals. Some of those will come from interstate. Some of those will come from overseas. But we welcome them all because they will provide great care for the people of Western Australia. 
The Madam member Speaker. for Belmont. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to supporting Western Australians facing hardship, particularly as the state recovers from the economic impacts of COVID-19. And I ask, can the Minister outline to the House how Synergy is supporting those West Australians who are doing it tough and helping prevent them from being disconnected? And can the Minister advise the House if he is aware of anyone who believes the government should not be supporting struggling West Australians? The Minister for Energy. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I'm very pleased to answer the question from the member for Belmont, and I know her deep commitment to helping people in hardship. I know that's one of the motivations that led her to this place. And I want to say that uh, Synergy has been prioritising hardship over the period of time the, that uh, the McGowan government's been in power. And last year we saw a range of COVID supports that helped people in hardship. But of course, we also saw the $600 account offset. We saw the doubling of the energy assistance payment from $305.25, which meant that the lowest income earners in Western Australia got $1,210.50 of free electricity from the government of Western Australia during uh, uh, 2020. We've, uh, the, the government's reformed the HUGS program so that rather than helping Synergy, it helps uh, ha people in need. We've introduced the Household Energy Efficiency Scheme, a scheme mirrored on a program that was run by the former Gallup and Carpenter government and abandoned by the Liberal Party when they were in power. And we're implementing the Smart Energy for Social Housing that's seen significant bill reductions for people in social housing. But Synergy continues to work hard uh, through the Keeping Connected program, which is, which is in-person outreach to uh, their customers. You'll see that Synergy is now advertising, inviting customers uh, that are having trouble with their bill to speak directly to Synergy so that rather than the first problem being getting a bill they can't handle, that, they, that they're actually in, inbound to Synergy to get help uh, from a range of uh, assistance that Synergy can provide. Synergy has been working with financial counsellors and they've created an online portal, which is a really major reform. It allows the uh, 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 financial counsellors to see exactly what's happening with the Synergy uh, billing system. It's led to the Financial Counsellors Association writing to me to congratulate Synergy on the work they're doing to work with financial counsellors to help people in hardship. We've seen the, the government uh, fund additional case managers uh, into, uh, into Synergy starting in July last year. They've got seven of the 11 dedicated managers on board already and we're already seeing excellent results. They've worked with the 1,600 people in most hardship and we've seen 430 of those, over a quarter of them, already graduate, at, graduate so that they can now support themselves without needing additional assistance. And we've also seen them focus, Synergy focus on family violence. And we know that one of the problems that many people in hardship have is that they're the victims of domestic violence and that they've been subject to coercive control and they're being left with debts. So I'm very proud of the work that Synergy's doing there to help people uh, in, in that terrible situation that are suffering from family violence. But the member asks who are not supporting this action. Well, I was very surprised on Friday to hear that the member for Cottesloe doesn't support this action. The member for Cottesloe went on radio and said it was shocking. It was shocking that the Labor government is working with Synergy to do all these things. And that he said it was shocking that we weren't sending in the debt collectors, that we weren't just taking a, a financial approach to this, that we're actually working with customers to make sure that their life can handle the situation that they're in. Because we can for people in that situation. I don't go on radio saying it's shocking that the no debt collectors are being sent out uh, to, the, uh, to the people of this state. And it's no wonder that that's the attitude of the member for Cottesloe, because in the last time the Liberals in government, disconnections went up by 86.2%. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communities. Minister, I refer to local support service providers in the South West reporting there are approximately 100 pregnant women without a fixed address and a, a recent significant spike in demand for newborn packs for homeless mothers. And I ask, one, can you guarantee that women giving birth at local hospitals can you guarantee that women giving birth at local hospitals and their newborns will be supported and provided with suitable and stable accommodation? And two, is there any risk mothers who do not have a fixed address at discharge would be separated from their children? 
The Minister for Community Services. Um, Madam Speaker, um, I actually haven't heard that uh, information that the member is referring to, and I would have appreciated um, her bringing that to the attention of my office before raising it in this place. Uh, it, is not, it is not my understanding ever that um, children are taken into the care of child protection um, simply because there's no accommodation available uh, for the mother. In fact, um, everything is done to make sure that uh, people who, um, who need emergency accommodation are given emergency accommodation. And if there are any um, concerns about what would happen once a, uh, um, someone who's facing a range of, of difficulties, whether that's domestic violence, mental health, drug and alcohol issues, whatever they are, um, uh, housing insecurity, that those issues are dealt with before the baby's born uh, and um, supports are given to that family. And in fact, we've put a record amount of investment in early intervention um, assistance for families to ensure that children don't come into um, the, the child protection system. So uh, to answer your question, I'm not aware of, of the circumstances that you're talking about. We're well aware that there are housing pressures um, throughout the state and uh, in, re in regard to um, the amount of the demands on private rentals as well as the public system. However, I do also note that there has been record building approvals, and the Premier talked about this in question time last week, I think over 80 per cent of building uh, approval increase uh, in, um, I think, last year. So there are significant building approvals, and there's been quite a bit of commentary that once those buildings uh, are built and, um, and people are able to move into them, then that will in turn take pressure of private rentals and into the public system. Uh, and of course, we've had significant uh, investment by this government into um, public and uh, social housing as well. Uh, I would urge any uh, either um, individuals, families, community members or their representatives, if they know that of people that are in that sort of hardship to get involved with services or the Department of Communities, um, because uh, it certainly should not be the case that, um, that there are, uh, are risks to keeping uh, families together because of homelessness or the threats of homelessness. Supplementary. Thank you. Thank you. Leader the Opposition with a supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Uh, 100 women without an address is seriously concerning. Is there a specific program that government offers? Is there a, is there a specific program or support service that women can uh, access, given their vulnerability as they go into hospital, potentially with the risk of losing their child? The Minister of the Community Services. Um, I do note that the member hasn't referred to the authority for the information that she's giving to us today, so I would her urge her to have given um, to, to come to either the Department of Community or th through my office to give that information so that we can give proper support uh, to those uh, women uh, and their families uh, as required. Um, I, I, it's important to note that there are extensive services that are available for people throughout the state, and that includes in regional, in regional areas, uh, whether um, those women are um, pregnant, whether they've got children or not. Uh, quite a lot of work is done to ensure that there's stable accommodation and, importantly, proper supports. And in fact, with the Department of Communities, we're best placed to do that now, knowing that child protection services, as well as the Department of Housing, um, that gives support uh, for people who are in public housing or, or looking for public housing, are, are placed together um, to give support to those uh, to those people. So, um, both through the Department of Communities and the Department of Health, I'm surprised that you talk about those numbers, and I would urge you to seek for those people to get in touch uh, with the Department of Communities district offices, or for you to give me some of that detail through my office, so that we can deal with those issues a bit more uh, constructively uh, than in the Parliament here. 
the member for Southern River. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, before I uh, ask my question, I'd like to acknowledge the students of Canningvale College in the public gallery on behalf of myself and also the member for, member for Jandicott. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Seniors and Ageing. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to continuing Labor's strong record for supporting our seniors, including the introduction of the WA Seniors Card by the Dowding Labor government 33 years ago. And I ask, can the Minister update the House on how the McGowan Labor government is helping ease the financial strain on seniors card holders, particularly those who are, play, who are facing financial challenges as a result of COVID-19? The, the Minister for Seniors I and Ageing. I certainly can. And I'd like to thank the member for Southern River for his question and also acknowledge the tireless work he does in connecting with his community and in particular bringing forward the issues that seniors face in his community. So I thank you. Now, the McGowan government is a champion for seniors in Western Australia. And the WA Seniors Card Programme was brought into being by a great Labor Minister, the Honourable Kay Hallahan, in 1988. Yeah, yeah. And it was a first, a first in programme of its kind in Australia, and it was subsequently taken up right throughout Australia. And that just goes to show what a great and innovative initiative it is. The WA programme provides seniors across the state with access to an average $650 annually in total value for state government concessions, and more if they hold a Commonwealth Seniors Health Card or Pensioner Concession Card. In July 2021, more than 312,000 West Australian Seniors Card members received the cost of living rebate, in total approximately $25.5 million. Singles will receive $93.12, and couples will receive $139.64. The WA Seniors Card Program also provides members access to over 900 business discounts, and I know those are in great demand, and they offer great savings every day, assisting seniors with the cost of living. And what's more, Madam Speaker, the McGowan government will soon be reintroducing the safety and security rebate, and that will allow WA Seniors Card members to claim up to $400 per household to go towards installing or buying home safety or security devices. Now, these, these concessions, Madam Speaker, are, uh, were able to deliver those because of the strong and responsible budget management of the McGowan Labor government. And I know they're going to be very well received by our seniors community. Thank you. The Leader of the Opposition with the last question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, I refer to the State Government's Quarantine Advisory Panel and I ask, one, how many times has the Quarantine Advisory Panel met since its formation? Two, will you table the minutes of these meetings? And three, if not, why not? The I Minister for Health. Madam Speaker, I don't have the answer to that. The uh, Quarantine Advisory Panel is actually formed under the Department of Premier and Cabinet. Obviously, uh, they are meeting on an ongoing basis. I've had a meeting with the Chair, so I know they are meeting and considering um, items. And um, I spoke with the Director General of Health yesterday, who I think has a meeting with them today. So if that provides you an idea of the level of, of, of activity. Uh, but beyond that, Madam Speaker, I don't have any other details. Supplementary. Uh, supplementary. Thank you. Minister, can you confirm that all 16 recommendations of the Wiramanthri report, of which the formation of this panel was one, have actually been implemented? I would suggest that you're vastly expanding your original question. With that, it's not really a supplementary, but I'll allow the Minister to respond. Uh, on this I don't occasion. have any more details to provide the Chamber, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> are there any petitions? If not, uh, papers, papers for. Sorry, you've got a petition? So, the Attorney General. Uh, to, uh, to the Speaker and members of the Legislative Assembly of the Parliament of Western Australia assembled, we, the undersigned, the LGBTQIA plus students in WA public schools are not receiving the protections to which we are entitled under law and instead suffering from a culture that enables and perpetuates homophobia, transphobia. Currently, students in the LBT IQA plus community are being consistently demeaned and stigmatised by their peers through actions such as referring to particular behaviours as gay, mimicking typical gay behaviour and attitudes with the incentive to cause offence. 
As a direct result from this, the LGBTQIA plus students are being substantially affected with some, some of these harms being having a feeling of shame, a rise in <clears throat> sleep disturbance, experience of social isolation, having low self-esteem, school avoidance, a loss in mental stability and having to stay hidden in the closet. The Western Australian Equal Opportunity Act, which has the key objective to promote recognition and acceptance within the community regarding equality of all persons regardless of their sexual orientation, does not outline what is classified as intolerable student conduct. Despite the Act covering how LGBTIQA plus individuals should be treated in schools by school administrators, there is nothing, nothing stating how students should treat each other. Now, we ask the Legislative Assembly of Western Australia to take action on A, legislation to protect the LGBTIQA plus students from discrimination in our public schools and, and by other students. B, acknowledge that LGBTIQA plus students need special protection under law. C, immediately investigate why this issue is still evolving despite society's shift in values and attitudes towards LGBTIQA plus acceptance. Additionally, will you integrate and update the current 2018 version of the Equal Opportunity Act to address A, it is lawful for students, it is unlawful for students to bully, intimidate or discriminate an individual because of their sexual orientation. B, it is unlawful for students to use offensive slurs with the incentive to cause harm and offence to that individual. Otherwise, the state government to produce a new act to address these matters, the total number of signatures being 91 students. The petition is tabled. <coughs> uh, papers for tabling. The following paper is pre presented for tabling. Local laws in relation to the Local Government Act 1995. Uh, giving notices of motion.